I'm an art historian, but I'm also an art, an art critic and I identify today as an art critic. I'd like to speak about a, a certain number of pieces, but also um, they come in the way I've seen them because my work as an art critic is to experience uh, exhibitions and museum collections and encounters with artists. I don't know Bruce Nauman. So my encounter with Bruce Newman was through exhibitions. So I'm, I, I've chosen a few pieces that I've seen in different exhibitions that I remember, actually that I'm much more than remembering, that are totally obsessive for me because I think there is an obsessive quality in Norman's works and I'd like to talk about that. The obsessive is so much all the time there. <laughs> I know, I can imagine. So it's a point of encounter for all of us. My first experience, peace experience, is, is the floating room lit from inside of 1972. I think I saw it in the early 90s um, uh, in Schaffhausen, Switzerland, you know, at the Hallen für Neue Kunst, where uh, actually, you know, there was a permanent installation of Naumann works that opened, I think, in the 80s. So I was with my parents, and um, my parents had driven from Elsass, which was the region where my mother had been born. We were there in Schaffhausen and we were facing this this cube, this vast cube hanging from above. Um, It was in a dark area and we could see this kind of stream of light coming from the inside. It was not very reassuring, I have to say. (laughs) We opened the door, we went in and we finally found ourselves totally disoriented. Because in the in the white brightly lit room, uh, there was no handle, there was no ceiling, there was absolutely no object to rest uh, our, our gaze, our anxious gaze on. You know that the center of gravity of the cube is a bit up, up uh, in relation to your body or the center of your body. Uh, the space is both very constrained and finds no escape in the outside, which is dark and that you can't see. So we had this incredible feeling of being alone, of finding ourselves inside a room that is also an outside for us, and that had absolutely no symbolic connotations. And it was maybe semiotic, but not symbolic. I think it's very important. So the idea you weren't in chapel, you weren't in the palace, you weren't in the meditation room, it was not at all that. You were alone. You were left alone with yourself and uh, in a kind of, of, of places of emptiness where the emptiness of the outside play sort of reflected or paralleled a kind of emptiness in your own body, in your own mental space. That's what I find so fascinating in actually in Nauman's work, that he addresses what I would call a kind of body without organs. It was a space of doubt. It was a space without spectacle, without exercising your, your gaze. And What I noticed is that my father was like jumping up and down when he went out of this room. He was like crazy. He was... He's a, he was an ba- uh, um, infant psychoanalyst, you know. He was specialized in the relation of psychoanalysis to babies. And he was kept keeping, you know, saying, this is exactly what a baby feels. This is exactly what a baby feels. I don't know how he found that out. But anyway, <laughs> he, was, he was thinking that this space indeed was not a symbolic space, that it was this moment maybe where the infant um, experiences something in trying to apprehend the difference between a surface with an inner side and a surface with an outer side. And it's still not a given. There is a a space uh, there that I think psychoanalyst Didier Anzieux characterized as le moi peau. You know, I don't know the translation in English, but I think it's the eye skin. Huh? the ego skin, the eye skin, the, the, the idea that there is a kind of, before there is a, or with the psychic eye, the psychic ego, there is a kind of physical, corporal ego, eye. And where the surface of the body 
becomes a space and a psychic space. I was totally fascinated by this notion of space. And I think it's, you know, which is, which is a, a, a liminal space and also a space for passage, a space for transformation, a space for passage. And, and for me, it's not for nothing, actually, that the piece you, you talked me so much about, Caroline, Walking with Contraposto, um, the, the first 60-minute video version, at least, was filmed in a corridor in that kind of space where you have problems in knowing if you're inside or if you're outside. And uh, then I have to make a kind of historical remark. I have to go back to the original version of, I mean, to the first version of Walking with Contraposto because it's, it's 68. And I, I have to say, I can't read now uh, Walk with Contraposto, the, the 68 version at least, without thinking the space of the corridor, this liminal space, along with what uh, the incredible queer science fiction writer Samuel Delaney recounts when in his memoir, he recounts the experience and the space of the trucks in the, in the, in the west side of uh, downtown Manhattan, the trucks in which every day or every night uh, whatever, it was very dark inside, and this is where men met met to actually fuck without seeing, without the whole experience of distance made by the gays, because it was totally dark, and they were entering those trucks, and they had this very specific uh, bodily and spatial experience. So I cannot see this piece now without thinking about uh, Delaney's story. And of course, the, the, the queer reading of this, of this piece has been made, you know, by others than me. But it's true that the way the artist ambulates his, his body down the, the corridor for 60 minutes, it's really like sashaying back and forth with twisting it, his hips in a relentlessly uh, difficult attempt to, to inhabit a kind of ideal sculptural posture, the posture of contraposto. So for me, he's like a go-go boy, uh, swishing during 60 minutes uh, in a constrained space. And uh, it really reminds me of the entitled Go-Go Boy by Felix Gonzalez Torres. And it's not for nothing that Felix Gonzalez Torres' uh, piece, Untitled, untitled Go-Go Boy, is sometimes activated by the go-go boy coming and dancing, but sometimes you only have the pedestal. And it's not for nothing, I think, that I see also all the corridors that have been built by Nauman into museum as this kind of pedestal, you know, uh, the pedestal coming from the studio or the corridor coming from the studio and suddenly installed in a, a, a museum space. I would say... Maybe it's a, well, maybe we could, we could think about that. It's maybe, um, it's a stateless space. And that's what's so interesting. Let me think about another work. Let me think about the body. Let me think about uh, that, th those incredible works. I think I saw them in, in Basel, maybe. At least I saw one in Basel. The other one I don't remember, but I remember very well the work. You know, the one in Basel is Henry Moore Bound to Fail. And, uh, but let's take the other one, you know, the Untitled of uh, 1967, which is supposedly in the Daros collection for your own. Uh, it's the piece, you know, of you have the, the folded pair of arms which are in plaster covered with wax and they're folded with a knotted rope, a kind of a very physical rope. I read that they're used for ships and they have this incredible bodily aspect. So there's a kind of double bind, if I may say, immediately. And double bind is the regime at least Caroline and myself are living right now during the confinement where we have... In real life. Yeah. yeah, in real life. So double bind is also a word that really preoccupates me at this moment. You know, it's a double bind because both are bound. So the, the upper part 
um, the, the 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 knot of the of the ropes uh, suggests and 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 forces you to feel constraint and tension, and the latter part, on the contrary, with the folded arms, well. It suggests maybe the contrary, you know, the, the the arms bound or folded like that. It means it means at least two things. It means the constraint, but it also means the refusal. I don't want to work. Um, I'm on strike. I don't want to do anything. I'm doing and I'm not doing. And this is, you know, one of the many double binds I find in Nauman's work. Because to me, Nauman is also somebody who uses all the time negation, negativity. The no is always there. The refusal is always there in Nauman's work. And I find it incredibly um, important and necessary to me. So I also feel the physicality of the, wor- of the words. Of course, you know, we've all seen, and that's all the exhi- all, all Nauman's exhibition, including, you know, all the art fairs I've been to in the world. There's always a word piece by Bruce Nauman. For me, these words have the incredible capacity of being so physical. Uh, they're physical because they have effect on me. And they're physical because they're also about... Uh, about figures of speech, about rhythms, about uh, flux, and not about interiority as such. But it, it's like Nauman's spaces for me. The words are physical. They're, they're corporal. They have a body because they have an effect and because they have a rhythm, because they have a flux. I, I associate, you know, run from fear, fun from rear, live or die, all that. Um, I'm very conscious about uh, the work of Judith Butler when I read those words or when I see those words and I hear them. Two things, you know, Judith Butler has made very clear in Bodies That Matter, her second book, that there are no pure bodies, that language is already there. Um, But also throughout her work, she also insists that language is a bodily matter, that language is performative, that language can kill, and no man knows that. Words are physical, they're, they're, they, they pass through the body, and they are a rhythm, they are a cadency, they are something like the law inscribed, like, you know, um, Kafka's penitentiary uh, colony. Nauman's words always made me made me think of uh you know the the incredible uh song by Laurie Anderson oh superman cuz when love is gone there always there's always justice and when justice is gone there's always force and when force is gone there's always mom hi mom so hold me mom in your long arms so hold me, mom, in your long arms, in your automatic arms, your electronic arms, in your arms. So hold me, mom, in your long arms, your petrochemical arms, your military arms, your electronic arms. You remember, oh, Superman. Well, I'm totally and still obsessed, and we've talked about that with Caroline, by Clown Tortured that I actually saw in the Reina Sofia exhibition. I didn't see it at the Reina Sofia exhibition. I heard it. For many, 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 many days and nights, I heard the no, 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 no. It was actually shouted throughout the rooms of the Reina Sofia. No, 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 no. No, 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 It's something that actually is totally obsessive and it's, it's, um, it's like in the Tate installation, which I will talk, you know, later, there is the, the, the sound of these no, 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 which is semi-hiding the other sound and particularly the nursery rhyme, you know, 
which one of the clowns tries to recount. For me, nursery rhymes are always, I'm always thinking of the Night of the Hunter. They're terrible for me. And you, you, you see that one of the clowns on the, on the monitor is repeatedly beginning a story about Pete and repeat and sitting on the fans. Pete fed off. Who was left for Pete? For me, it's, it's the Night of the Hunter that's there. And then there are, there are the, the other clowns which are trying to balance objects and in a kind of slapstick comedy. But everything is tainted by the no incessantly screamed uh, by the clown while jumping, kicking, or lying down. So, you know, you're turning between the abject and the aggressive, between the tortured and the torturer, and talking about space. Where am I? What kind of participant? What kind of spectator am I? Which side? With whom do I identify? Well, both. And of course, you remember that many, many things that have been written on Bruce Nauman have been referring to Michel Foucault. And of course, you know, uh, Foucault's analysis of the panopticon in Surveiller et Punir, to, uh, Surveiller et Punir um, stressing, of course, that the model of modern subjectivity relies not only on surveillance uh, by the observer in his tower, in his central tower, but on, of course, on the internalization of that surveillance by the observed. May I add something about the fact you spoke about baby at the beginning and the no is the first identity things when you you get old. It's the most difficult thing to say. Ab absolutely. And you know, the, the first distance of the baby with uh, his or her mother is the mother that says no. It's the first separation yeah. of the limits we were talking about. Of course, it, that's why it's so necessary. And we never hear it in our shows, you know, better than now, man. We never, we, we, we don't often uh, hear that no vividly said. At the Reina Sofia, there was also another work that actually talking about surveillance, talking about surveillance and about what can be concealed from surveillance. There was this other piece that was in the Reina Sofia, and I think it is now at Mumok in, in Vienna. It's, of course, audio video underground chamber. I think it was first installed in Antwerpen in 1974. So we were talking about space of surveillance, space inside, space of the outside. That's something really peculiar because it's a space outside the museum, which has been carved and where the chamber, like a corridor, a small corridor, has been buried. In Madrid, it was near El Carmen, if I do remember well. So it was a space outside, a, a concrete corridor that had been carved and literally buried within the ground. And you could, of course, you could only see, but you could see, and you could only see that space and its containment through a surveillance process, um, through the monitor in the gallery that was actually transmitting life, the sound and image, uh, that was recorded through a microphone and a camera. Uh, that is the sound of silence and the image of a void constrained by four walls. So there was, in a way, nothing to see, and you were left with the nothing to see. But I see, saw this place as some kind of closet, as the uncanny and in the uncanny, because I immediately associated with terror, the fact that it was the space where you can never see yourself, of course, the space of the tomb or of the death of or absent bodies. And I was reminded of Louis Marin's words about autobiography. I'm totally obsessed by that. You know, Louis Marin says that there are two things you cannot say is I'm being born and I'm dead, and I'm dying, and I'm dead, at least. So for me, the, the audio-video underground chamber is performing that in the sole presence 
of the media, of the apparatus made to watch. Again, it's a double bind. It's showing something which is not possible to see, performing something which you cannot perform as a person, as a thing, as an I. But it's also undermining all these presumptions. There was, of course, same thing with the double bind, uh, get out of my mind, get out of this room, 1968, which uh, was the obsessive ritournelle uh, that, that I, I watched, I saw, well, can you see something, yeah. at, the, <laughs> at the Centre Pompidou, uh, at the Naumann Show at the Centre Pompidou. You know, the place, it is a really, it's a small room, if I do remember where you hear a voice, but you don't see where it's coming from, which with interna varying intonations, sometimes really not very sympathetic intonations, there's screaming. Get out of my mind. Get out of the room. So you are invited to go in and you're expelled. By the way, isn't that a political statement today? Oh to get rid of all the exception we're living every day, including the double bind mood. Including the double bind. And get out of my, you know, get out of this room is okay, but then get out of my mind. What does it mean, you know, in terms of, again, interiority, what you can conceal, what you can withdraw, what is an artist in facing its audience, its public? What is our relationship? Do we get into the artist's minds? I, I, I don't think so. But, you know, the invitation and the throwing out is something which is, again, um, enacted as a very violent thing, as a very constrained thing, and as a way to make you think about these things, you know, what is inside, what is outside, what do we do when we visit an exhibition? What do we, what do we do to the work? How do we deal with this quality of private in public and public in private? And of course, there's nothing like that. It, it's, it's a dissolution of even this idea. And again, I'm reminded of, of Felix Gonzalez Torres, you know, who said when you, you were censored, when two people fucking, you know, the image of two people fucking is censored, sometimes you have to find other ways to deal with private matters. Or sometimes you have to feel other ways. You have to think about other, other devices to talk about this very complicated uh, space of privacy, of concealment, of the secret. That's how... No one works for me, you know. It's like everything is supposed to be open uh, and then everything is shut down. You can see inside the tomb, inside the grave, but then you see nothing. And then this, the, there is this element of enigma, of silence, of concealment, of secrecy. In the process of knowing, you have to go through these impulses, through these ideas, I think. So I would like to end with the exhibition at the Tate which and the exhibition in Venice for me were uh, a kind of really, uh, again, you know, all these questions for me were addressed with the physicality of words. And to me, it was transposed to something I think that musicians and a few musicians, somebody like Paulino Oliveros, has really thought about that. What is listening? What is listening? Uh, what is listening socially? What is listening in our dialogue? What is listening in, at, the, at the impact, at the effect of, of words? And the idea to take out or to scrape out or to withdraw any kind of visuality mm -hmm. um, you know, I remember very well arriving to the, the turbine hall at the Tate and being totally <clears throat> suspended to listening to the words, to, again, to making the words, having a kind of corporeity, which I 
very complicated cooperate mm. because there was this mm, that was continuously there. Mm. And then you had these, you had to go from one loudspeaker to another loudspeaker. So the idea of listening to more than one voice was something that was really in, interesting. Mm. And uh, of course, being here and hearing, mm. which is something mm. that he, um, there, which is said in one of the loudspeakers, is, is for me also um, a kind of rethinking again about what I was trying to say in the beginning with this idea of what space are we? How can we mm. enter? How can we live in a space? How, we can, uh, how can we live in a space that is also unlivable? 